Hi, welcome to another uh, week, another recommendation for For Art's Sake. My name is Carson. Uh, so I'm going to begin this week uh, looking at this screenshot here of the websites. Um, if you recall from last week, we were talking about avant-garde cinema and, and in particular one work of avant-garde cinema, one early work of avant-garde cinema. We're going to continue this series on avant-garde cinema by again returning to Jonas Mekis, who, if you recall, founded the preeminent institution for preserving avant-garde films, Anthology Film Archives. So one of the ways that Anthology Film Archives sought to preserve and promote avant-garde cinema was to was through this, this program, Essential Cinema. And this was an attempt to actually define the uh, history of cinema through a lens of avant-garde. So these, you know, it involved Jonas Mekis himself, as well as many of the other founders of the Anthology Film Archives. And these included uh, P. Adam Sidney, who was a major scholar of avant-garde film, uh, as well as major, uh, so Peter Kubelka, who was an avant-garde filmmaker himself. And so what these, this, this selection committee tried to do was to build a canon of cinema that ran counter to other canons of cinema. When most people try to define cinema uh, and, and just try to pick a set of films that they consider to be the definition of cinema, right? The quintessential cinema. They usually pick popular works. They usually pick the first works that come to mind. And so Jonas Mekis and, his, and, and the rest of this uh, selection committee tried to create an alternate canon that included, uh, that, that focused on the avant-garde, the independent. And so for the rest of this uh, series, and as well for that, that first recommendation, we're going to focus on films that are in this collection, Essential Cinema. And this includes a film that we're recommending today, which is Man with a Movie Camera, directed by Giga Vertov in 1929. So uh, what I'm going to try to do, um, of course, I have a limited amount of time. This film is actually another one of the relatively few avant-garde films that are uh, very, very well known. It is highly well known and highly well studied. In fact, uh, in 2014, it was actually rated by Sight and Sound magazine as the best documentary ever made. And I believe in 2012, it was something like number eight best film period ever. Um, so this is a film that is relatively well known and well studied, uh, compared, especially compared to other avant-garde films. But that might also strike you um, as interesting because it's a documentary. We'll get into that in a little bit, but documentary and avant-garde are actually very close, closer than you than most people would imagine. But this is kind of both a documentary and, and avant-garde. So what I'm going to try to do in this recommendation, I'm going to try and look at some sources and some information that is not necessarily the most talked about stuff, right? But I'm going to try and look at it in a less kind of cliche way. And so I'm going to focus on the context, how this film came about, as well as on the writings of Giga Vertov, uh, his manifesto, We Variant of the Manifesto, and try to, to have you understand this film in its context, as well as its role in the development of this Soviet avant-garde art. And so this film is really, ha has a deep place in the history of Soviet avant-garde art in, in the early 20th century. So if you think about what was happening in the early 20th century, we, we talked a little bit about the avant-garde art movements that were happening in the early 20th century last week. This was really the, the, these key moments in the development of modern art. Uh, but in 1911 to 1918, of course, a big thing that happens is World War I. And this was a sudden wake-up call for many who were already starting to engage in more revolutionary ideas, right? Starting to read Marx and Nietzsche and uh, Freud, and they're already starting to think to challenge the existing order and to think in more um, innovative ways. But in particular, the World War I was, was what totally shattered people's faith in established orders. It totally changed things. And people realized that the old Europe cannot stand. Because what they saw, many of these artists went on the front lines, right? Um, this was a war that involved millions and killed millions. It was a level of death and destruction that people had not seen ever before. You know, it was truly unprecedented. So many of uh, there were artists who went to the front lines and they saw the killing and destruction on these unprecedented levels. And they came back with its, this new fervor that we needed a complete revolution in art. And so across Europe, part of what fueled World War I was this deep sense, sense of nationalism. And, and these artists understood that. Nationalism, especially in the sense of nationalism in a faith in an old order, in this old order where people fought for king and country, where wars were honorable things to do out of faith for your country, faith for your leaders and, and your, your culture kind of. And so this sense of nationalistic war, but World War I shattered those illusions completely. This was no honorable war. This was a war filled with bombs and airplanes that you know dropped those bombs and machine guns, wanton destruction, you know, poison gas, this total loss of life. It was cruelty. There was no nationalism or honor in this. And so it shook their faith in the traditional nationalism that was uh, prevalent in Europe. And in particular, Russia evolved in the wake of World War I as a hotbed. Uh, for this new revolutionary spirit. It, it was across Europe, um, but in particular, Russia was where people really had faith in a new radicalized system where to, to try and completely detach from the old ways of Europe, which they believed were, um, had decayed or, or you know, was oppressive. And the reason why it was Russia that, that um, had all this faith and had a, had a sudden hotbed of uh, sort of radical movements in art, well, because of the Russian Revolution, right? If you think about 1917, 1918, this is when the Bolsheviks led by Vladimir Lenin um, in large part, actually, in reaction to the war, uh, in reaction to the large amount of killing, they led this movement to overthrow the Tsar, overthrow the traditional order as monarchical, uh, monarchical in, in Russia, and establish a new order that sought to do 
it's not to improve society, right? Now, of course, this is uh, controversial because there were many cruelties that happened here as well. This, but what Lenin was, you know, the famous slogan that Lenin based his political movement on was peace, land, and bread. It was a, a movement based on the idea of creating a new order based on justice, based on ideas, especially from Marx, that we could try and overthrow the economic hegemony and oppression that was in Europe uh, at the time and, and force upon the people in Europe. And when you hear this today, the Soviet Union, the government that Lenin founded, Lenin and his Bolsheviks founded, the Soviet, which was a Soviet Union, and, and generally doctr the doctrine of communism uh, that the Soviet Union stood for, today is really synonymous with oppression, right? So it, it seems to make no sense that how could this society have been founded on these noble ideals to try and overthrow the oppression uh, of capitalism, the, the, the uh, power and hegemony that kept so many people oppressed. There were serfs, you know, landless peasants, who had to toil for their masters. Um, and, and so there was clear oppression there. It seems to not make sense that the communist revolution in Russia and the establishment of a communist Soviet regime, which today, again, is synonymous with oppression, was based on these ideals. Well, in those early years, when Lenin uh, was leading the Bolsheviks, um, in those early years of the Russian, Russian revolution, there really was a sense of optimism that would eventually kind of dissipate. And we'll actually get an insight into that. But there was a deep sense of optimism and hope that this revolution really would be like nothing that came before. And it really would succeed in creating the society that could finally throw away oppression completely. The ruthless individualism that they saw as a hallmark of capitalist culture, of nationalistic culture. Uh, these people, these progressives, and especially the artists in Russia at the time, the avant-garde artists, they believed that finally these dogmatic tenets of individualism could be completely overthrown for a completely new culture that threw away not just all the bourgeois culture, that's replaced the fundamental assumption of individualistic values with universal values um, that would be able to champion justice, remove inequalities in power. These are good things, right? These are noble ideals. And there was this actual deep faith in these ideals and this hope that sadly dissipated. We'll, we'll see why actually, or at least one reason for why. But at least in those early years, there was a real faith in this. And artists in Russia, these avant-garde radical artists try to support this new dream. They had this great hope that finally we can have a society that is just and equitable and works for the people. Um, and so they try to support it. They try to find as best as they could how best to support this new society, how best to support communism and the new revolution. And they did this searching, right, for how to support this society with art with intense fervor. Uh, incredible artists that came out of this are practically too many to name, from Elisitsky to uh, Kazimir Malevich um, to Tatlin, you know, so many artists that were incredibly influential and wrote densely, very influential and innovative and revolutionary thoughts on how art could be tied to politics, right? How you could actually use art and create a style of art that would be conducive to trying to make society better. So um, if you think about it, right, society is built on top of culture and art has this role, of course, and very deep role in culture. And so their thinking was, you know, maybe as artists, we can try and push, how can, we can link art with politics, link art with progressive values, and then try and, by pushing for those values in art, we can shift our culture, shift that culture from the individual culture to a universal culture. Okay, so well, we're going to take a look then uh, at this realistic manifesto. I'll read you the, the, the first few pages of this. This was a manifesto written in 1920 by Noam Gabo and Antoine Pelsner. Now, what you should understand about this manifesto is that it was a key manifesto in the development of one particular movement that was very influential on the director of today's film, Giga Vertov. And this film, uh, is, is very, very strongly um, a, a great indicator, very, 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 very signifying of a uh, significant film that shows many principles of constructivism. And as well as the films of his colleagues, uh, of Giga Verta's colleagues, which we'll get into, also show great influence from constructivism. So constructivism is one particular movement that came out in this early Russian revolutionary period, this period of great and sudden innovation and fervor in art that, that in particular influenced Giga Vertov and Man with a Movie Camera very strongly. In this great fervor, a huge number of different art movements with different philosophies came out of uh, post-revolutionary Russia. Not all of them agreed. In fact, um, there was even a very intense disagreement within each movement. Uh, and, and many artists actually shifted between one movement to another, right? Uh, we'll get, talk about one artist named Mayakovsky who shifted from futurism to constructivism and uh, to, to many other movements. There's Elisitsky who began as a suprematist and then moved into constructivism. It suffice to say there are many different movements, right? Because the fundamental question is, how do you make an art, or even is it possible to make an art that is fundamentally in support of leftism, in support of universal, uh, of a sense of like collective universal struggle, 
And so as you can imagine, the question that broad and that tantalizing, it's going to get a ton of different answers. And so likewise, there was a ton of different answers. So constructivism was one particular answer, although, but this is one uh, uh, manifesto early on in the constructivist movement that actually gave it the, gave constructivism its name. Uh, because it, it argues for a construction of art, a constructive method of art. This is a pretty complex text. It's a little bit difficult to understand. So um, to just briefly explain a few of the terms Nam Gabo and Antoine Pevner are going to use in this manifesto. Uh, so first of all, they, they talk about abstract, um, and it sounds like they're actually against abstract art. They, they are not actually against abstract art. In fact, they are the, the exact opposite. They are pushing for an abstract art. It sounds like they're against abstract art because they're arguing that art that isn't abstract abstracts truth. Uh, it's a little bit confusing, right? But if you think about art, the art of the kind of old masters, if you think about Renaissance arts, Baroque arts, you know, Rembrandt, Michelangelo, whatever, that art is representational. It is very clearly designed so that when you look at that art, when you look at a Michelangelo painting, for instance, um, it is designed to make you feel that it resembles some sort of thing in real life, right? But the way that Michelangelo and really any representational painter paints those is through illusion, through artifice. They use an illusion of depth to make you feel that it more realistically represents, you know, what it's supposed to represent. And so, and also many of those paintings are idealized, right? So if a representational art is, is really always idealized, it is not actually a one-to-one -one representation. You know, when Michelangelo paints some saints, it's not a one-to-one -one representation of the saints. It is kind of an idealization. It is that saint through Michelangelo's eyes. And so uh, Nam Gabo attacks the so-called abstract, but what he's attacking is actually representational art. And he's saying that art actually needs to be more abstract because that representational art, by using illusion, it abstracts our understanding of truth. And so remember that also that this is a movement that is constructivism is trying to figure out a way to tie art to politics, tie art to these leftist values. And so it is actively trying to make the art in tune uh, with the techniques and the forms that are not typically associated with high art. It purposefully says, let's forget about the old ways about art, right? It's, we need to move to a truly proletarian culture where we're learning not from haughty art schools, we're learning from the techniques of engineers, of carpenters. We should make our art with the bare bones, completely abstract geometry of the carpenter, right? And, and use compasses, uh, you know, to try and make this perfect geometry, the geometry that we deal with in everyday life and that does not try and abstract truth into some subjective. Uh, and then also he says that the glory of this art will come through in the velocity. It, it will come through in this beauty of geometry. How will you get this beauty of geometry? Well, when you reduce art to just pure abstract geometry, Gabo is going to argue that you can show geometry as glorious. You can show not just circles and squares and, and uh, triangles, but you can show circles and squares and triangles arranged in a way such that it, you feel speed and excitement in it. And so it can still ignite a kind of you know, power in this art, right? He's, he's saying that abstract art, ge complete geometrical art doesn't need to be uh, boring. It can have power and it should have power because this is supposed to glorify what the proletarian is doing. So we take the forms of the carpenter and the engineer and we're gonna glorify them. We're gonna make them feel exciting and, and powerful. And remember that, remember that they're gonna talk, they're, that they're talking about these, they're, they're talking about pure geometry and how to make geometry feel exciting by evoking its speed. Okay, so now I'm gonna read you in Nam Gabo and Anto Antoine Pevsner's own words, uh, the Realistic Manifesto, which played a key role in founding constructivism. Above the tempests of our weekdays, across the ashes and cindered homes of the past, before the gates of the vacant future, we proclaim to you artists, painters, sculptors, musicians, actors, poets, to you people, to whom art is no mere ground for conversation, but the source of real exaltation, our word and deed. The impasse into which art has come in the last 20 years must be broken. The growth of human knowledge with its powerful penetration into the mysterious laws of the world, which started at the dawn of the century, the blossoming of a new culture and a new civilization with their unprecedented in history surge of the masses toward the possession of the riches of nature, a surge that which binds the people into one union. At last, not least, the war and the revolution, those purifying torrents of the coming epic, have made us face the fact of new forms of life already born and active. What does art carry into this unfolding epic of human history? Does it possess the means necessary for the construction of the great, of the new great style? Or does it suppose that the new epic may not have a new style? Or does it suppose that the new life can accept a new creation which is constructed on the foundations of the old? In spite of the demand of the re renaissance spirit of our time, art is still nourished by impression, external appearance, and wanders helplessly back and forth between naturalism to symbolism, from romanticism to mysticism. I'll make a note here. He's, uh, they're talking about those realistic paintings, right? Those realistic paintings that um, they might look one-to-one -one realistic uh, representations of some person or some bit of nature. They're actually filtered through a lens, right? The lens of the artist that old representational paintings, even the most boring representational painting will inevitably be filtered through a lens. And the lenses that were very prevalent in the 19th century 
uh, where these lenses of naturalism and symbolism and romanticism and mysticism, they're saying that these kind of sentimental lenses, they're going to be, that, that was a problem of the old bourgeois art. Um, and then they're going to talk about cubism and futurists. So, so uh, the, the, the complaint about cubism is a little bit hard to understand. Uh, the, the, the problem that they're basically saying in simple terms is that the cubists are too formal. The cubists still too focus too much on painterly technique and not tying that technique to a political cause. So I'll continue reading now. The attempts of the cubists and the futurists to lift the visual arts from the bogs of the past have, only led, have led only to new delusions. Neither futurism nor cubism has brought us what our time has expected of them. Besides those two artistic schools, our recent past has had nothing of importance or deserving of attention. But life does not wait and the growth of generations does not stop. And we who go to relieve those who have passed into history, having in our hands the results of their experiments with their mistakes and their achievements, after years of experience equal to centuries, we say no new artistic system will withstand the pressure of a growing new culture until the very foundation of art will be erected on the real laws of life. Until all artists will say with us, all is a fiction, only life and its laws are authentic, and in life only the active is beautiful and wise and strong and right. For life does not know beauty as an aesthetic measure. Efficacious existence is the highest beauty. Life knows neither good nor bad nor justice as a measure of morals. Need is the highest and most just of all morals. Life does not know rationally abstracted truths as a measure of cognizance. Deed is the highest and surest of truths. Those are the laws of life. Can art withstand these laws if it is built on abstraction, on mirage, and fiction? And remember, this is the abstraction of truth, not abstract art. We say space and time are reborn to us today. Space and time are the only forms on which life is built, and hence arts must be constructed. States, political and economic systems perish. Ideas crumble under the strain of ages. But life is strong and grows, and time goes on in its real continuity. Who will show us forms more efficacious than this? Who is the great one who will give us foundations stronger than this? Who is a genius who will tell us a legend more ravishing than this prosaic tale, which is called life? The realization of our perceptions of the world in the forms of space and time is the only aim of our pictorial and plastic arts. In them, we do not measure our works with a yardstick of beauty. We do not weigh them with pounds of tenderness and sentiments. The plumb line in our hand, eyes as precise as a ruler, in a, spite, in a spirit as taut as a compass. We construct our work as the universe constructs its own, as the engineer constructs his bridges, as the mathematician his formula of the orbits. We know that everything has its own essential image, chair, table, lamp, telephone, book, house, man. They are all entire worlds with their own rhythms, their own orbits. That is why we, in creating things, take away from them the labels of their owners all accidental and local, leaving only the reality of the constant rhythm of the forces in them. One, thence in painting we renounce color as a pictorial element. Color is the idealized optical surface of objects, an exterior and superficial impression of them. Color is accidental and it has nothing to do, nothing in common with the innermost essence of a thing. We affirm that the tone of a substance, i.e. its light absorbing material body, is its only pictorial reality. We renounce in a line its descriptive value. In real life, there are no descriptive lines. Description is an accidental trace of a man on things. It is not bound up with the essential life and constant structure of the body. Descriptiveness is an element of graphic illustration and decoration. We affirm the line only as a direction of the static forces and the rhythm in objects. We renounce volume as a pictorial and plastic, oh, three. We renounce volume as a pictorial and plastic form of space. One cannot measure space in volumes as one cannot measure liquid in yards. Look at our space. What is it if not one continuous depth? We affirm depth as the only pictorial and plastic form of space. Four, we renounce in sculpture the mass as a sculptural element. It is, uh, it is known to every engineer that the static forces of a solid body and its material strength do not depend on the quantity of the mass. Example, a rail, a T-beam, etc. But you sculptors of all shades and directions, you still adhere to the age-old prejudice that you cannot free the volume of mass. Here, in this exhibition, we take four planes and we construct with them the same volume as a four tons of mass. Thus, we bring back to sculpture the line as a direction, and in it we affirm depth as the one form of space. We renounce, five, we renounce a thousand year delusion in art that held, that's the, that held the static rhythms as the only elements of the plastic and pictorial arts. We affirm in these arts a new element, the kinetic rhythms, as the basic forms of our perception of real time. These are the five fundamental principles of our work and our constructive technique. Okay, so, you know, I think key takeaways there is uh, early on he says he has that, uh, or they, they have this, this deep kind of optimism and hope in the new Russian revolutionary regime. They have this new hope that maybe we can support this proud revolution and maybe create this uh, great new society. And then also, you know, velocity, right? He's talking about rhythms, that art should not have beauty, uh, which is defined by bourgeois kind of old sentimental terms, but reduce it to the forms of the engineer and then give those for forms rhythm and velocity. Okay, so moving on. 
uh, Sabalat Meyerhold was one person who was influenced by uh, constructivism. He's a very, very influential playwright and uh, theater director. And you can see, uh, this is a famous image of one of the plays that he designed a set for. And you can see an application of those constructivist principles, where in this stage design, it is very, very abstract. And you can see that the actors are in dynamic poses. And also, the parts of the stage design are also dynamic. A lot of uh, diagonals, right, oblique angles. Um, a lot of geometrical shapes, but specifically geometrical shapes that are in opposition to each other. And you get a sense of the dynamism uh, here, uh, the velocity, the rhythms, um, especially through those uh, slanted angles, right, the, the oblique angles. And then also, um, you can see that it reduces them to look like uh, those of a construction engineer, um, that you can see the raw wood, you can see that the scaffolding here, it is like the engineer, and also, again, those dynamic poses of the actors and the oblique angles, it is the raw forms of construction and the engineer, you know, the kind of wood, raw wood scaffolding you'd see on a construction site, plus dynamism and velocity and rhythm. And then um, also another very influential artist was Vladimir Mayakovsky, uh, who was an artist, as well as a playwright and a poet, uh, probably most well known for his poetry, but also an influential artist in his own right. And he was uh, famous for editing um, a very influential journal that had a lot of writing from various different movements during this kind of exciting period in the early revolution, you know, very early Soviet Union, just after the revolution, this post-revolutionary period. Um, uh, this journal contained much of the very exciting writing from various different movements in this post-revolutionary period of avant-garde arts in Russia, but especially constructivism. And uh, I highlight this journal and Mayakovsky uh, because two of the artists that we're going to talk about, two of the filmmakers that we're going to talk about, including Jacob Vertov, contributed to uh, his journal, which was called Lief. And uh, Lief, uh, specifically had contributions from Sergei Eisenstein and the director of tonight's film recommendation, Jiga Vertov. Now, Sergei Eisenstein actually had his education in theater. He was actually a student of um, Meyerhold, uh, Sebelon Meyerhold, the guy who did those constructivist set designs. Um, so Eisenstein was very well versed in uh, constructivism, and he's probably the most well-known filmmaker in a movement that Jiga Vertov is considered to have been one of the key filmmakers in, which is Soviet montage. Now, and so Soviet montage is a very specific conception of editing, um, and, and, and it is a theory-heavy conception of editing. This is an avant-garde school, um, which had a, is very famous for, for its theoretical writings um, that is very important because it laid out the shot as a fundamental element of cinema. So Soviet Montage argues that cinema is basically this language um, where the shot is the word. And so a scene is a scene, is basically how you should edit together shots in a scene is just like how words come together to form phrases and then sentences. So uh, there are four really intellectual leaders of the Soviet montage movement, uh, four who are really famous for their theory, and those are Lev Kuleshov, Sevelo Pidovkin, Sergei Eisenstein, and Jega Vertov. Lev Kuleshov is kind of the, the intellectual progenitor of Soviet montage, where he first argues that the shot is the fundamental uh, element of cinema, and shots should be edited together. And um, for time's sake, I won't talk too much about Kuleshov, and I uh, highly recommend if you're interested in Soviet montage at all and what their theories are, look at the Kuleshov effect. But then one of his students was Pudovkin, Sevlok Pudovkin, a very uh, well-known filmmaker in his own right. And Pudovkin compares uh, the shots to bricks and cinema to building a wall. And so just like as you were to build a wall, you would, you would have to lay the bricks next to each other and then build up that wall, shots should piggyback off of each other, and then they should kind of add up. Um, so if you were to see shot A and then shot B, then it should form a, a, an addition, an additive process, right? Shot A plus shot B. Just like how uh, you lay down one brick in a wall and then you lay down the next brick beside it, and you have added them together to help form what would eventually be the totality of your wall. And so really shots in Pudovkin's uh, theoretical stance are the, the, the way that you communicate visually the story or the narrative. Eisenstein disagrees with Pudovkin. So um, this was a huge leap forward in Soviet montage theory when Eisenstein's theoretical writing was fundamentally based off of a dialogue with Pudovkin. Uh, and so Eisenstein says, well, no, actually, it shouldn't be shot A plus shot B just an out of process. It should, be, it should be that shot A plus shot B actually equals more than the sum of shot A plus shot B. And Einstein idolizes an American filmmaker, actually a Hollywood filmmaker, uh, for what is now known as intellectual montage. That filmmaker is D.W. Griffith. And Einstein sees in um, Griffith's films that he uses uh, a combination of shots to create an idea, what he calls, uh, so it does intellectual montage, right? Um, so in Pudovkin's method, let's say that I'm shooting uh, some person bursting into a room and then shooting someone. So Pudovkin would argue that you need to shoot the scene in a, a complete cinematic phrase using shots. 
So I might have a shot of uh, just of the door bursting open and the person coming in. The next shot might be that that person's arm raising up and in that his hand is a gun. And then the very next, uh, and then in that shot we see the gun firing. And then the next shot we see the person who has just been shot, you know, gasping, you know, clutches his wound maybe, and then falls over dead. Right. So there had three shots. I I, I was able to use a progression of three shots to build a cinematic phrase. Eisenstein says no. Shots should be collision, not bricks. Right. Shots should be individual cells in which there can be collision. A truly kind of dynamic. Think back to constructivism. Eisenstein says let's have a dynamic kind of collision, an explosion, really. Uh, and so I'm going to read to you just a, a brief section of Eisenstein's very influential uh, article, which is uh, called Beyond the Shot, the, Cinematic, the Cinematographic Principle and the Ideogram. And Eisenstein in this article, um, in the section of the article, basically talks about his disagreements with Pridovkin and Kuleshov. Um, so he writes, Kuleshov, for instance, even writes with a brick. If you have an idea phrase, a, a quote, quote in Kuleshov, if you have an idea phrase, a particle of the story, a link in the whole dramat dramaturgical chain, then that idea is expressed and built up from shot signs, just like bricks. Screw by screw, shot by shot, as they used to say. Going back to Eisenstein now, end quote, the shot is an element of montage. Montage is the assembling of these elements. This is a most pernicious mode of analysis in which the understanding of any process as a whole, the link, shot, montage, derives purely from the external indications of the course it takes, one piece glued to another. I'm going to uh, skip a few paragraphs here, um, dot, dot, dot. The shot is by no means a montage element. The shot is a montage cell, beyond the dialectical jump in the single series shot montage. What then characterizes montage, and consequently its embryo, the shot? Collision, conflict between two neighboring fragments. Conflict, collision. Before me lies a crumpled yellowing sheet of paper. On it, there is a mysterious note. Series, P, and collision, E. This is a material trace of the heated battle on the subject of montage between E, myself, Eisenstein, and P, Kudovkin, six months ago. We have already got into a habit. At regular intervals, he comes to see me late at night and behind closed doors, we wrangle over matters of principle. So it is in this instance. A graduate of the Kuleshov school, he zealously defends the concepts of montage as a series of fragments in a chain, bricks, bricks that expound an idea serially. I opposed him with my view of montage as a collision, my view that collision, that the collision of two factors gives rise to an idea. So let's take a look at that in actually uh, action. So this is from a film, a really great film by Sergei Eisenstein in 1925 called Strike. Now, uh, just the plot um, context for this scene, the film is about a strike by workers during Tsarist Russia. And uh, like the rest of avant-garde arts in this period uh, in, in Russia, it is intended to support the revolution. And so um, it, it's going to be all about uh, kind of showing the workers as innocent. And so at this moment in the film, the Tsarist, the, the, uh, Tsarist forces send over their troops to quell the uh, strike, to basically stop the strike. And the method that they resort to is to just slaughter the striking workers wholesale. And so what we see is the striking workers are running for their lives peacefully while they're gunned down by the uh, Tsarist troops. Okay, so um, that's a, a graphically violent scene, but I, I think you can see what, uh, what what Eisenstein means by collision and also how that gives rise to an idea. A completely unrelated shots in that scene, or seemingly completely unrelated shots in that scene, of the slaughter of a cow. Uh, but the idea is that this is supposed to give rise, without use of any intertitles, you know, no dialogue, no text at, at all necessary, just visually, the uh, strikers are helpless, much like a cow that is slaughtered, and the cow is struggling for its life. It has no way to defend itself, and yet it is ruthlessly put down, uh, just like those uh, strikers. And it also shows, it kind of gives you the idea that the, that the uh, Zara's troops are ruthless. And so this is something that is done, not by intertitles or dialogue, 
Uh, but you can see that if you were to only see the shots of the slaughtering of a cow, then you would say, okay, this is about the slaughtering of a cow. But by combining those things and then colliding them, by, by putting a shot of the workers and then shot of the cow, shot of the workers, shot of the cow, by colliding them, Eisenstein actually gives you the idea that, oh, wow, these, um, you know, uh, that the analogy that the workers, striking workers, are much like that helpless cow. This is a metaphor that can only arise if these shots are arranged in a particular way that they're arranged. Uh, so, but you all, you might also have noticed that, uh, let me skip around. Ah, okay, here's a, uh, here's a good example. This, this, this scene has so many diagonal lines. Yeah, well, it's a fine to say there were many, many diagonal lines. So remember constructivism, right? Emphasizing those oblique lines, oblique angles, uh, to get that velocity, that dynamism, that rhythm. Okay, so now we'll move to Giga Vertov, who is also considered a member of the Soviet montage group, because like Eisenstein, he's interested in the shot as a fund, or like Soviet montage in general, I should say, he's interested in the shot as a fundamental element of cinema. Uh, but also like Eisenstein, specifically, he's also interested in trying to bring a constructivist sense of uh, dynamism, velocity, and also collision, right? Also the sense of total excitement and chaos to the shot. Um, and he is particularly fascinated, and in general, actually avant-garde cinema across the early few decades of cinema's history they were completely fascinated by cinema's ability to actually show you things that, that the naked eye could not. And so Kuleshov's uh, big theoretical idea about this is the kino eye. So he argues that cinema is not like seeing normally, right? It may look hyper-realistic. It looks photorealistic. When you watch a film, it looks photorealistic to real life, but it is not at all uh, realistic to what you would see in real life. Um, it has actually been enhanced. The vision seen by the camera, or what the camera sees, is fundamentally cinematic. Um, and and uh, there are ways that you can uh, manipulate that. So one example is, for instance, you could attach a camera to the front of a speeding train. You could not see what it's like to be strapped to a speeding train. But a camera, you can strap to a speeding train and just put it there. Or maybe you can dig a little hole um, underneath the railroad tracks, put the train in that, or sorry, put the camera in that little hole, and actually see what it, what it looks like to be run over by a train. These are things that the human eye cannot see. But the kino eye, the film eye, right, the cinema eye, the kino eye can see. And so um, this is a fundamental thing that uh, Jigo Vertov is arguing, that the kino eye sees not tr empirical truth, but a subjective truth, which is what he calls kino pravda. But kino pravda, the, the cinema truth, is actually an enhanced truth. It is a more powerful truth. And so Jigo Vertov argues for a cinema that is even more radical and even more avant-garde than Eisenstein, which is completely devoid of any kind of narrative. Uh, or at least any kind of clear narrative. Absolutely no script, absolutely no inner titles, no dialogue whatsoever, S uh, but it would still have emotions, and it would still have events, and it would still have a progression of events. But these, the, the, the events and the progression of events and uh, the kind of quasi-narrative would be entirely told through the kino eye and the manipulations, and that's what Man with the Movie Camera is. Um, and so Giga Vertov in this, his manifesto, the variants of the manifesto, uh, expresses exactly these ideas, and it's uh, very profoundly, and he argues that Actually, we should completely kill and bury the so-called psychological cinema, right? The cinema that relies on scripts and stories and narratives. We should just kill it and turn our cinema into a pure embrace of the kino eye and kino pravda. He argues that those Hollywood films and uh, that, that, that have narratives that, that are just completely focused on the story and telling the, uh, the story in the script, you know, they're completely plot focused. They actually lose track of kino pravda. They, they don't, by obscuring truth with a script, with this artificially created story, you have actually uh, made, it, made it impossible to interact in a meaningful and, and interesting way with Kino Pravda. If you're not chained down by a story, then you can just go and do wild and interesting things with Kino Pravda and, and, and freeing cinema from story is, makes it a more powerful tool, perhaps a more powerful weapon. So I'll read you the entirety of the variant of the manifesto. We call ourselves Kinops, that's men of the Kino eye, as opposed to cinematographers, which uh, Giga used to refer to Hollywood style cinematographers as opposed to cinematographers, a herd of junkmen doing rather well peddling their rags. We see no connection between tr true kino shetsvo, which is uh, the, basically the quality of the cinema eye, the, the quality of kino eye, and the cunning and calculation of profiteers. So uh, let me just repeat the sentence. We see no connection between tr true kino shetsvo and the cunning and calculation of the profiteers. We consider the psychological Russo-German film drama weighed down with apparitions and childhood memories in absurdity. To the American adventure film with its showy dynamism and to the dramatizations of the American Pinkertons, the Kinox say, thanks for the rapid shot changes and close-ups, good, but disorderly, not based on a precise study of movement. A cut above the psychological drama, but still lacking in foundation, a cliche, a copy of a copy. We proclaim the old films based on the romance, theatrical films and the like, 
to be leprous. Keep away from them. Keep your eyes off them. They're mortally dangerous, contagious. We affirm the future of cinema art by denying its present. Cinematography must die so that the art of cinema may live. We call for its death to be hastened. We protest against that mixing of arts which many call synthesis, the mixture of bad colors, even those ideally selected from the spectrum, produces not white, but mud. Synthesis should come at the summit of each art's achievement and not before. We are cleansing Kinoshetsko of foreign matter, of music, of literature, and theater. We seek our own rhythm, one lifted from nowhere else, and we find it in the movements of things. We invite you to flee the sweet embraces of the romance, the poison of the psychological novel, the clutches of the theater of adultery, to turn your back on music, to flee out into the open, into four dimensions, three plus time, in search of our own material, our meter and rhythm. The psychological prevents man from being as precise as a stopwatch. It interferes with this desire for kinship with a machine. In the art of movements, we have no reason to devote our particular attention to contemporary man. The machine makes us ashamed of man's inability to control himself. But what are we to do if electricity's unerring ways are more exciting to us than the disorderly haste of active men and the corrupting inertia of acid ones? Saws dancing at a sawmill convey to us a joy more intimate and intelligible than that on human dance floors. For his inability to control his movements, we temporarily exclude man as a subject for film. Our path leads through the poetry of machines, from the bungling citizen to the perfect electric man. In revealing the machine's soul, in causing the worker to love his workbench, the peasant his tractor, the engineer his engine, we introduce creative joy into all mechanical labor. We bring people into closer kinship with machines. We foster new people. The new man, free of unwieldiness and clumsiness, will have the light, precise movements of machines, and he will be the gratifying subject of our films. Openly recognizing the rhythm of machines, the delight of mechanical labor, the perception of the beauty of the chemical process, we sing of earthquakes, we compose film epics of electric power plants and flame, we delight in the movements of comets and meteors and the gestures of searchlights that dazzle the stars. Everyone who cares for his art seeks the essence of his own technique. Cinema's unstrung nerves need a rigorous system of precise movement. The meter, tempo, and type of movement, as well as its, as its precise location with respect to the axes of a shot's coordinates and perhaps to the axes of universal coordinates, the three dimensions and the fourth time, should be, taken, should be studied and taken into account by each creator in the field of cinema. Radical necessity, precision, and speed are the three components of movement worth filming and screening. The geometrical extract of movement through an exciting succession of images is what's required of montage. Kinoshetsko is the art of organizing the necessary movements of objects in space as a, as a rhythmical artistic whole, in harmony with the pro properties of the material and the internal rhythm of each object. Intervals, the transition from one movement to another, are the material, the elements of the art of movement, and by no means the movements themselves. It is they, the intervals, which draw the movement to a kinetic resolution. The organization of, the, of movements is the organization of its elements, or its intervals into phrases. In each phrase, there is a rise, a high point, and a falling off, expressed in varying degrees of movement. A composition is made of phrases, just as a phrase is made of intervals of movement. A kino, who has conceived a film epic or fragment, should be able to jot it down with precision, so as to give it life on the screen, should favorable technical conditions be present. The most complete scenario cannot, of course, replace these notes, just as a libretto does not replace pantomime, just as literary accounts of Scriabin's compositions do not convey any notion of his music. To represent a, a dynamic study on a sheet of paper, we need graphic symbols of movement. We are in search of the film scale. We fall, we rise, together with a rhythm of movements, slowed and accelerated, running from us, past us, toward us, in a circle or straight line or ellipse, to the left, to the right and left with plus and minus signs. Movements bend, straighten, divide, break apart, multiply, shooting noiselessly through space. Cinema is, as well, the art of inventing movements of things in space in response to the demands of science. It embodies the inventor's dream, be he scholar, artist, engineer, or carpenter. It is a realization by Kinoshetsko of what cannot be realized in life. Drawings in motion, blueprints in motion, plans for the future, the theory of relativity on the screen. We greet the ordered fantasy of movement. Our eyes, spinning like propellers, take off into the future on the wings of hypothesis. We believe that the time is at hand when we shall be able to hurl into space the hurricanes of movement, reined in by our tactical lassos. Hurrah for dynamic geometry, the race of points, lines, planes, volumes. Hurrah for the poetry of machines, propelled and driving, the poetry of levers, wheels, and wings of steel, the iron cry of movements, the blinding grimaces of red-hot streams. Let's now get back to Man with a Movie Camera as a documentary. So um, if I told you that this film was an avant-garde film, you might assume that it's fictional, just like on Chandelou. If I told you that it was a documentary, and I didn't mention anything about avant-garde cinema, you would probably think that, okay, everything in this is true then. But why? There's nothing innate about documentary that differentiates it formally from narrative film or avant-garde film. And yet people assume, simply because they're told that 
they film as a documentary, that it must suddenly represent truth, or at least reality. That's what makes documentary so close to avant-garde cinema. It's effectively a weapon. Um, it's, it's effectively cinema that is made all the more powerful because people assume that it's truth. Documentary thus, by nature, can, uh, is specially organized to, to um, play around with truth, just as avant-garde cinema uh, plays around with truth often, and how Man with a Movie Camera as avant-garde is all about probing how cinema and truth interact. Documentary is thus super, super close to avant-garde cinema, innately by the nature of its, uh, because people assume that documentary films are real, uh, are not fiction, then it is by nature in a perfect place to contemplate the nature of truth. Uh, now, some documentary films decide to do this more, some decide to do it less. And Man with a Movie Camera in particular decides to probe the nature of truth, especially cinematic truth, particularly deeply and interact in a thoughtful way. Um, but so let's consider very briefly Man with a Movie Camera as a documentary. Bill Nichols, who's uh, the most well-known theorist of documentary in his book, Intro to the Documentary, says that Man with a Movie Camera is a textbook example of the reflexive mode of documentary. He has a very eloquent uh, and, and easy to understand definition of what the reflexive mode of documentary is. By the way, he defines documentary as having six principal modes of how documentary films are, are made or, and approached. Well, the reflexive mode of documentary is documentary that specifically has the approach where it is to call attention to the assumptions and conventions that govern documentary filmmaking. In, it increases our awareness of the constructedness of the film's representation of reality. So it's self-reflexive. It, it makes us aware that we're watching a film and that films are, are constructed. They're, they're not real. They're not truth, or at least not subject, or they're not objective truth. And so this is a film that kind of is about film itself. And so here's a shot from Man with a Movie Camera that, that particularly exemplifies this. Uh, in the film, there is a section of the film where it actually shows the film being edited. And so the documentary suddenly shifts from just a documentary to a documentary about the very documentary. So you, you're suddenly aware that this is a human-made product. Um, that, 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 that's a fascinating part of it. Now, I should say that the film in general, the narrative of the film, is basically just a day in the life of a typical, in a typical Soviet city. Um, so you see people, you know, waking up, stores opening, and then goes to the thing. But I want to end with, unfortunately, a sad note about what ended up happening, right? So there was this period of great optimism, of great fervor, of great hope. Why did that end? Well, in 1923, Lenin is stricken with a stroke. Uh, you can see Lenin there in that photo where he has the stroke and he's uh, basically uh, ridden to a wheelchair, uh, and then dies shortly afterward in 1924. Unfortunately, um, there wasn't a clear successor, and uh, there was a power struggle in which Joseph Stalin, also pictured here, won the power struggle. He ended up uh, becoming a dictator. But most important for our discussion here, or our lecture here, is that Lenin was actually very friendly to avant-garde art in Russia and the Soviet Union. Um, he actually appointed uh, people to run the Soviet uh, state-run film agencies, the film production studios, who are actually friendly to avant-garde cinema and actually uh, funded many projects to experiment further with um, avant-garde cinema projects, and also funded many pro exhibitions of avant-garde art. And he was, um, you know, uh, uh, perfectly friendly to avant-garde artists' experimentations and fostered those experiments. Stalin was the exact opposite. He fired those film and art administrators who were friendly to avant-garde artists that Lenin had appointed and appointed his own art, uh, administrators who were uh, who demanded the bringing back of an extremely conservative representational style. So remember constructivism and, and so much of this avant-garde art is all about abstra abstraction. Stalin said the exact opposite. We need conservative kind of realism. His logic was that avant-garde art is just too hard to understand to effectively communicate with the proletariat. But regardless of what the thinking was, he basically destroyed uh, the avant-garde and demanded that anyone who was still making avant-garde art either stop, um, change new style, or just stop making art, or face the consequences. And very sadly, Meyerhold, the teacher of Sergei Eisenstein and uh, that constructivist playwright and set designer, he was killed, uh, arrested basically for literally just making the art that they wanted to make. And because he continued to stage the avant-garde style theatrical productions, Stalin had him arrested by the secret police and killed. Uh, and um, his wife was killed as well, uh, very ruthlessly. And then Mayakovsky, the guy who published uh, that journal, that influential journal that Juga Vertov and Sergei Eisenstein both wrote for, Lef, um, he was basically harassed and, and uh, continuously um, pushed around by, by Stalin's cronies until he was forced to commit suicide. And some even believe that his death was actually not suicide and done by you know, secret police. And then finally, Eisenstein and Vertov were both forced to stop making films. Um, in Eisenstein's case, he actually made a film during the height of Stalin's reign or a series of films called Ivan the Terrible, and it was supposed to be a trilogy, but he finished and released the first two parts, but Stalin found them just distasteful, and midway through the production of the third part, the final part, uh, Stalin had the film confiscated and destroyed, and it is unfortunately probably forever lost. Vertov is similar by the late 30s, um, so, so during Stalin's reign, his, his uh, Giga Vertov's 
output slowly started getting slower and slower as his style was criticized more and more and censored more and more until by the late 30s he completely just was banned from uh, effectively banned from making films um, and uh, died soon afterward um, so that's a sad ending but perhaps as a tribute to these uh, avant-garde artists and this brief moment in world history of great hope that a new society that is just and equitable, equitable could be built a brief moment and a glimpse at some um, true change true progress and unfortunately it was cut short but a, a moment nonetheless perhaps as a tribute to this. I hope you can uh, watch and enjoy Man with a Movie Camera. Thank you.